Welcome to the Dividend Talk podcast, episode number three. Daniel Horick, a Norwegian perspective to dividend investing. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Dividend Talk. I'm your co-host, Engineer My Freedom, and today I'm joined with European DGI. This is a podcast where we discuss our passion and knowledge for investing in personal finance. In this episode, we will take a brief look at the news, but I'm also excited to be joined by Daniel Horick, who has joined us today to talk about his life in in the army and dividend investing. All of this with a very own unique European flavor. If you've just joined us, please hit the like and subscribe button. Like us on YouTube, we're also on Spotify, Google Podcasts and iTunes. And as always, Feedback is greatly appreciated. Let's get straight into it. Hey, European DJ, welcome back to another episode of Dividend Talk. How's your week been? My, my week was pretty good, a bit busy at work, uh, at the same time working a bit on the blog creating an infographic about the Noble 30 index, as you might have seen. I also published two templates um, for, my view, for my readers so that they can calculate a little bit uh, their re- retirement goals and also uh, track their portfolio. But if you look at it from the news from the week, I found something really interesting because I think midweek somewhere, the European uh, Union Commission, they published their unemployment numbers which came out at 7.4 percent i didn't see anyone really reacting on that and then i think it was on thursday or friday the u.s released their numbers and they have an unemployment rate of 11.1 percent so almost uh, a three and a half to four percent different in unemployment and when you put those numbers together it was really really uh, interesting for me because we get a lot of news feed from the US yeah, um, on, on how it's going with the economy. But if I see this, then just on the headlines alone, it, it seems that the European Union is actually doing quite well. I know we have some um, regions in Europe really impacted, but I was really positively surprised about the numbers. I would have expected a different, uh, probably this US bias based on the news that they, they are cheering and partying with, <laughs> with, with the job numbers at the moment. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. And, and as you say that, I came across an article la- earlier in the week with BlackRock that they've actually changed the US to underweight. So they're actually a little bit bearish on, on the US going forward. And they changed the EU from underweight up to overweight. So they're kind of expecting the European Union to grow a little bit better over the next couple of years based on on the numbers coming out which which like you said is not the feeling that i'm getting from the us or from guys on twitter or anyone that i'm that i'm talking about and it's, it's quite strange actually to see i think about the s&p 500 had its best or second best ever quarter and it's it's not really connecting with what's happening around it, it just seems totally disconnected to me what, what do you think on it or so what I what I find really interesting is probably what the European versus the US policy was when the pandemic came out. I think um, they threw a lot of money at it in the US and the European Union did, did something similar. I just think that in general, US might come off, come off from better job numbers uh, in general from a US perspective. But I just think that the social system that you see more in Europe is just better fit for these situations. Um, you cannot just lay off many people. So I think in a downtrend, I think for people, it's better to be in Europe when it comes to job safety and job protection compared to the U.S. So I think that in general, the job numbers are probably more volatile in the U.S. because it's more protecting companies over people where I have a feeling that in Europe, compared to the U.S., we protect more people versus companies, although we are still in a quite strong capitalistic system, of course. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly something to keep an eye on over the next few weeks and few months. And, and for me, it's important, as I mentioned before, to just keep diversifying that portfolio and trying to expand my reach in, into the US or into the EU, sorry, um, just to try and get that 
diversification. But that's enough on the news for today. I'm really excited about today's episode. We have our first ever guest. We've got Daniel Horik with us today. How are you, Daniel? Um, I'm good. I'm a little bit tired. Been a long week. Uh, I'm off duty, but been staying with my girlfriend and uh, moving into a new apartment. So been a lot of heavy, heavy lifting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. I know the feeling. I've had a long week myself with work. I'm, I'm on vacation next week, so working late trying to tie up my loose ends this week. But I suppose we'll just get straight into it and. I suppose our listeners and, and I'm interested to hear about your journey in particular about your investing journey and how you got started. Um, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for, uh, for having me. Um, but um, the journey started uh, when I was starting to save money in the bank account. Um, however, the bank account doesn't really give you any good returns, especially not in Norway. So I had to read a lot uh, bought myself the intelligent investor uh, the book is about uh, benjamin graham very interesting book on how he picked out his stocks and then i sort of started my uh, journey in the stock market uh, mostly just in norway uh, however i quickly find out found out that uh, the norwegian market isn't really anything you should go for when it comes to dividends uh, the norwegian companies they're good, but the margins are very low. Uh, so when a pandemic like this happens, it's it has catastrophic uh, impact on them. Uh, they're just cutting everything out, uh, dividends. Uh, so I had to move, uh, rethink my strategy. Uh, and then I went with my current portfolio, uh, which is going to be a 60% on the US stocks and 40% in EU. So um, I'm slowly building that up, um, having a hard time picking out stocks that are cheap. Well, stocks that looks undervalued. Um, but currently I have 11 holdings, uh, including one UK holding actually, British American Tobacco, which is, I don't know why, but it is my favorite company. Uh, kind of weird, but I have this, I don't know, hate love thing for UK kind of and the companies over there. So uh, slowly building it up, um, but it's going to take a lot of time because I, I'm currently, I'm trying to get all the dividend aristocrats from the U S all the dividend aristocrats from uh, the uh, European uh, markets and also some Asian uh, dividend aristocrats. Uh, so 114 companies currently. Um, so it's gonna take a lot of time, especially since the uh, Asian stock market has this weird limit. You have to buy like 1000 shares minimum of a stock and uh, that's gonna be a lot of money and money I currently don't have. So eventually. It's really interesting. And um, I've got two follow-up questions um, that you triggered me. So one is, uh, why did you choose dividend investing? Uh, I will be really interested to, to learn about that uh, because there are alternative uh, investing strategies as well. So maybe you could explain also a little bit what your goal is with investing, what you are trying to achieve and how dividend investing plays onto that. And then uh, the second question is, um, if you would like to have the U.S. aristocrats and the EU aristocrats and the Asian ones, why not ETFs? Could you explain both questions? Elaborate a bit. On um, uh, good questions. Um, number one, um, I started with dividends because um, you have this passive income that's growing each year. I kind of want to make money while I sleep and while I do other things. And at some point in life, I kind of want those dividends to uh, cover all my expenses. Um, even if it's uh, rent, uh, the, the electric bill or whatever, uh, the dividends, I just kind of want them to just cover everything in life. Um, so that's why I started with uh, dividend stocks, uh, then moved on to dividend growth stocks because I, I was still learning. I, I thought higher yield meant higher payout and more sustainability, but 
obviously that was not true. So I went dividend growth stocks and now I'm just waiting for the dividends to grow each year uh, to the point where I can actually start uh, using the dividends for um, things in my daily life, such as rent, for instance. Um, and the other question, um, why not go for an ETF? Um, I have this... Uh, kind of love thing for making a portfolio um, it's something personal it's it's like um it's like everything else you do in life you know you kind of want to make it personal you just don't want to buy something that's already made you, you kind of want to make it your journey along the way so that's the only reason really i think most people would be better off with uh, just picking a uh, etf or regular uh, uh, fund but the whole journey is about building your portfolio. And I really love how to allocate the uh, different stocks and st stuff. So um, that's basically the whole reason for why I went with exactly yeah. that. It resonates a lot with me. And we did a podcast, uh, uh, the former one also about ETFs. But when I hear you, um, it sounds a little bit similar to me because for me, it's not just dividend investing, but also combination of value investing. Yeah. So over um, time, I look at undervalued stocks. Uh, so they've got a margin of safety and you won't have that when you buy an index or an ETF. No, exactly. Uh, for me, it's all, all about finding undervalued stocks, uh, buying at the right price. So you actually have some value to look at uh, on, on the stock price, not just the dividends itself. And I think that's very important instead of just buying more for a stock when you when you know you can get it for cheaper it's like buying a tv or a car you know uh, you don't have to pay more than enough and it's same thing goes for the stock market why why would you pay more when you can get it cheaper does does tax come into the equation because because like you i'm in a similar situation with, with irish companies and when it comes to etfs and i discussed this in the last episode the tax on etfs kind of force me down the, the route of you no know, cherry picking individual stocks but how about you does does tax come into it how does the tax compare in selecting dividend stocks over etfs does that have a major impact on your decisions um uh, depends which which kind of broker you have um i had this broker that did all the taxing for you so all the paperwork and stuff they, they sort of took care of that um but you, you tax on everything in Norway. Uh, the Norwegian government wants a piece of everything. Uh, so uh, the taxes are the same. Uh, you, you still have to tax, but the amount of tax is, may, uh, may be different. I'm not really too sure about that. Uh, but I know that I'm being taxed 15% when picking individual stocks, especially in the EU. Uh, and the US. So it's the same amount there. But for ETFs and funds, not really too sure. If you buy, if, if I would, if I were going to buy a, a Norwegian fund, just regular fund, uh, there, there would be less taxing than uh, an ETF from the US, for instance. But otherwise, uh, you still get taxed. So I, I just always calculate with getting taxed. Do you have um, both dividend withholding tax and capital gain tax, or do you have a wealth tax? Uh, good question. Um, I'm not really sure since I moved to DigiRo. They do things a little bit differently than the Norwegian brokers. Um, and like I said, I never really saw how the taxing thing worked. Um, but I did some reading, and I think you are getting taxed on um on everything like capital gains and dividends but in the in the norwegian uh, broker i used uh you had this uh, you were not taxed until you moved the money out of your account mm. so the taxes never actually happened until the money was withdrawn yeah okay and um daniel we, we also learned uh, also from twitter that you're in the military can you explain a little bit how the military um, are being a, 
actually are you a soldier in the military or well, maybe yeah, that's I'm the first soldier. question <laughs> so how does that impact your your journey when it comes to dividend investing because what i know in general um, when i look at investing really important is the savings rate and one way of increasing the savings rate is not just by lowering your cost base but also to increase your income Mm. And uh, what I know from other people that I knew in the past, when you're in the military, it's not so easy as in the corporate, for instance, uh, to have a rapid career and grow an income. So I'm curious to whether this is the case for you as well. And if so, how does that impact your, your journey in general? Um, so, yeah, I'm a soldier. I'm just a regular foot soldier. Um, you're not really getting any... Uh, race no so it's not like working in the private sector where you get a race now and then uh, in the military you're just here's your salary and that's the salary you're getting get uh, for a long time until you getting promoted or something so the the race in in salary happens when when you get promoted basically or if you get a, a new job between the uh, the force uh, if, if, if if that job is has some higher risks for instance uh, you can get a little bit higher salary but nevertheless uh, it's pretty much the same over the years unless you're getting promoted but um, since it's my first year I, this is like the uh, I mean I'm just going to stay there for a year um, because I have to <laughs> not because I wanted to um, but you're not getting a lot of money I can say that uh, you're getting you're getting uh, pocket money, as they call it, just to have something uh, if you want to buy chocolate or whatever. Uh, but instead of all the other guys buying uh, tobacco and stuff, <laughs> I'm like going for uh, dividend stocks each month. And now I just moved in with my girlfriend, so having having an apartment to pay for as well. So I'm seeing my uh, salary coming in. Uh, and it's going out <laughs> five minutes later <laughs> so so uh, but it, it's it's fun uh, I'm always looking forward to, to the salary even though it's very low um, because when it comes I know I can buy stocks and buying stocks it's that's what makes me happy makes it worth it do you purchase stocks each month or week when you get your salary or? Um, I'm buying buying stocks every month um looking once a month uh if i have more funds i usually go for more uh, but it depends uh i, I need i, I kind of need a girlfriend to feed so <laughs> i have to look at uh, look at the possibilities of buying more stocks and and as as you invest in monthly does the currency does the exchange in currency come into it is it expensive to actually buy your stocks kind of i kind of never look at the currency i if, to me the currency it's something that just going to be very uh, volatile uh it's just going to be bouncing up and down uh until forever so i never really look at the currency uh, at some point i'm buying possibly at bad times uh, because the currency is bad uh, and sometimes I buy when it's good so it kind of kind of gets equal at some point anyway so I really don't spend much time on hitting the market on the right time but it is something to consider but because you can save a, a little bit of money on that but yeah yeah we're, we're kind of the same I invest monthly as well, so I don't really look at the fluctuations. I, I kind of just hope that it evens out over time. At the yeah. moment, at the moment, euro to the dollars is quite cheap. They're very similar, so yeah. we're, we're not. Um, it's not something that I pay attention to, but it's always interesting to hear from from other European countries, especially because your currency is. I think it's quite expensive compared to. Yeah, to I mean, the, our, our currency is pretty expensive, as you say, um, but again. When you buy, uh, when you buy monthly, it kind of gets equal at some point anyway. So it's just nothing I really want to spend my time on on learning more about or or uh, kind of hitting on the right spots because it's just pointless for a couple of percent percentages here and there. Just not worth it. 
if we were talking 100%, then, then obviously I would have paid more attention, but a couple of percentages here and there, it's just nah, nothing, to, nothing to worry about. Maybe um, uh, an awkward question, but how is your girlfriend uh, with you on the journey of dividend investing? <laughs> Funny you would mention that. Um, we've been we've been having a lot of uh, um, not fighting, but uh, we've been uh, ha having these arguments or or discussions. Uh, she really hates the stock market, and she's like obviously very scared of it. Um, so when I was like, I was having my computer up uh, at some point. I was just having a toilet break or something, and she was like, "Wow." Uh, what is this, Daniel? And I was like, oh, oh, that's just my portfolio, you know, building my portfolio in the stock market. And she was really mad <laughs> when she found out. But um, we're slowly getting her started with, uh, with funds. Um, so she's starting slowly in the stock market as well. She's never going to be the kind of uh, person that's going to build her own stock portfolio with, with individual stocks. That's never going to happen. Uh, first of all, she does not have the interest. Uh, she does not have uh, the passion for it. So it's just better off with, with regular fund. But so we're getting there slowly. She's counting on you to uh, uh, deliver financial independence. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, got, I've got the same issue. <laughs> <laughs> same here. I think a lot of that has <laughs> just something about the women, you know, just just... just really scared of something that simple to understand you know i mean the stock market isn't really that hard to understand you're just betting against someone else and you can keep a stock for a lifetime if you want if you buy at t you can just having you can just shove it away and just look at it in 60 years and it's still going to be there I, so but, i understand what you say but i also remember how it was for me when i was 25 and i was probably more like your girlfriend at the time <laughs> Because for me, um, um, investing was more like speculation at the time. Mm -hmm. So I would buy a stock for 200 euro. And I mentioned it in one of the former podcasts. And when it went one, one, one person up or down, I, I got nervous. So either excited or nervous. And, um, and I always appreciated my saving account because that's how I've been raised and grown up. If you save something for a later day, then you'll do well. Yeah, and then you, and you will always be able to pull on those savings, but then later I just started to read more and more and more, and I, I just realized actually I'm saving is probably the biggest risk that I have because inflation is is even higher than the saving uh, the interest rate on a bank account, so I'm actually getting poorer every year. So mm -hmm. and that started to switch my mindset, and then I really had to try um, uh, this. So I do understand why your girlfriend has time to adjust. It took me five six years. Uh, uh, to get into that mindset and it's really really not easy if you have this dogma and starts already at school like save for a rainy day save for this it's always saving 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 it's never ever almost investing 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 when we had it in, in at school it was about bonds yeah when it was yeah, investing yeah. not stocks so yeah yeah i mean i mean kind of get her as well um there is something something secure about having this savings account. But then again, I'm slowly trying to show her that the interest rates are very bad. You're not going to mm -hmm. get anything on it. You're actually losing money every year. Yeah. Uh, so you'll be better off in the stock market, even though it seems scary and it looks scary and you're betting against the market and other people, but still there are uh, better options than the savings account. Okay, so Daniel, maybe a last question from my side. What what have you learned um, along the along the journey, and what are you still trying to figure out as a dividend investor? Um, I've learned which markets to stay away from, uh, specifically in the Norwegian market. Uh, there, it's a very cyclical uh, kind of market. We are very dependent on oil and uh, on the energy sector itself so I just kind of kind of learned to stay away from the Norwegian market um, it's just not a very healthy market to be in uh, and trying to buy stocks that are undervalued that's that's something I really want to get better at 
uh, finding cheap stocks, stocks that are traded below fair value, um, and uh, continue to learn about how dividends works, how how to build a better portfolio. You you can always improve. You know that's the first wing we learn in the military. You're never you're never going to be a perfect version of yourself. You can always improve something every day. So I kind of I kind of have that mindset now. Um, I can improve on everything I do, and I always kind of f- trying to find these flaws, uh, even in my portfolio, myself, doesn't really matter. I just always try to improve everything I do. So uh, when I'm building my portfolio now, I'm just, I just saw that I had way, way too much uh, equity in, uh, in AFL, for instance. I was like, okay, I got to do something here. So I sold a couple of stocks and moved the uh, allocated the funds into three other companies uh, instead just to get the uh, diversification uh, better so what so i can it, say daniel is um, you shared your portfolio the other day on twitter and i hmm. think it's quite a nice portfolio um, already and uh, so i get sometimes this question and you might then also get it like so ED, edgi why do you have these overweight of, of let's say uh, stocks in your portfolio for instance the energy sector and for me it's like okay i'm a, i'm still in the beginning of my accumulation phase i'm on 25 percent of my my goal let's say so when you use a value investing approach often you go more into a certain stock when they're down and the energy sector had that as an example um so that's why i'm a bit overweight but i'm not touching it anymore now because i've got enough in it yeah so and uh, I noticed a little bit similar into your portfolio. That's why I ask also the question, how many stocks? Uh, you mentioned 11, so you still need to go to 114. Uh, so it's like you're on 10% of your yeah. desired portfolio, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I have 10% of my desired portfolio. Um, it's going to take a lot of time because hitting these, finding these stocks when they're actually undervalued, that's, that's the hard part with investing. Uh, yeah. Because there are there are a lot of companies that are a little bit overpriced. So, yeah. Okay, thanks a million for sharing your journey. It was quite interesting to hear you know, from a different perspective and and quite similar, quite similar to me, and, and probably quite similar to European DJ. Our goals kind of align, and, and like you said, my portfolio is not perfect. And I think one of the the fallacies, I suppose, of investing monthly is that you're going to be overweight in certain stocks at a period of time but if you're looking for value it's it's going to happen so over time it will even itself out and that's that's what i'm hoping and i'm kind of going through that journey of trying to reallocate my portfolio and I, i'm really heavy in, in companies such as tea which i know you love um but i'm trying i'm trying to reduce not reduce the amount of shares that i hold but maybe catch up with my other holdings to catch up to even out my exposure to to certain companies but maybe one last question i know you touched on norwegian companies but is there any norwegian dividend stocks you'd recommend or any companies you'd recommend our listeners look into um there might be one um it's called orkla um it's it's a consumer staples company basically it manufactures all all kind of food and stuff in in norway so it's the Probably the biggest company in Norway, uh, not by market cap, but by uh, by the amount of products that people use every day. Um, and the dividends are pretty safe. Um, but then again, this, this, this kind of pandemics and this, this kind of situation like we're experiencing this year, uh, of course, it has an impact. Norwegian companies has have this uh, very low margin um, so that's the only company I would go for. Um, that's the most secured company, in my opinion, when it comes to dividends. Other people pr- probably have other companies they they would prefer, and that would be uh, that would be their opinion, of course. But I mean, you have Equinor, uh, you have other companies, but like I said, it's just this, the Norwegian stock market are so dependent on the oil and energy sector and like now it's it's not really a good time in the energy sector so nothing i i, I would never put my money in in a norwegian energy uh, company at the moment so or nice I'll, I'll certainly check them out 
So the next section, we usually take some questions from, from our listeners. And we, we had one from Russ Stapper Dividend, Dividends, which might interest you, Daniel, because he's also in the military. <laughs> and there's some interesting videos on his YouTube channel about that. You probably should check it out. But he asked the question, what are your concerns with Pepsi? And as I guess, I thought I'd ask you what your concerns are first. Um, I actually don't really have any concerns about Pepsi. Um, I think that Pepsi is a Pepsi. First of all, is a huge company. Um, they they are doing something very very good. The management is very good. Um, the depths can be discussable, but um, I still find the company very uh, very good. There are they have all these products that people buy every every day every month, every year, um, products like even the competitor Coca-Cola has. So it's like, uh, I, I really don't see any concerns. Probably uh, payout ratio. Um, I mean, last time I checked, it, it looked a little bit high, but, but um, otherwise than that, I, I, I think it's a great company. Maybe a little bit overvalued, but that's again. That's the stock price um, that changes. So at the moment, I wouldn't buy PepsiCo, but it's because it's overvalued. Yeah, just looking at their their payout ratio, it's their free cash flow was one hundred and seven percent, which which would obviously concern me. Mm. But but as a company, as you said, they're a huge brand and they they do sell a lot of products. My my only concern is it's a lot of sugary products, and I know they're diversifying into health. But as people are migrating more and more, particularly the, the generation behind me, to become more conscious of healthy eating, healthy you know, snacks, and it's how they actually migrate into that will, will concern me a little bit. And also this talk, I, I don't know in Norway, but there's, there's talks of taxing sugar here in Ireland and, and over in the US, and that might have a big impact on them. What, what would your thoughts be, EDGI? So I think Russ might have been referring to one of our earlier podcasts where I mentioned about PepsiCo, uh, whether it should stay a tier one stock. And I think you both touched already on something. So what I've seen in general is that their payout ratio is becoming more and more tight uh, related to their earnings and cash flow. Um, the dividend growth have been almost twice as much as, as their earnings growth. So I think it's around seven and a half percent or something like that. And their earning growth throughout earnings growth around four percent. The buybacks. So what I've seen in general is that this company was firing on all cylinders when it came to dividend growth, but at the cost of their balance sheets and make giving it less space to actually um, uh, keep increasing their their um, I said their dividends. So that's where my main concern is, like, should it stay a tier one stock? Because there are some good challengers, uh, uh, other companies that um, uh, I could exchange. So for me, it's not really about Coca-Cola versus Pepsi. If I need to choose between the two, definitely Pepsi. I like Pepsi as a company, to your point. Uh, they are not only in, also in, uh, in drinks, but also in snacks. They are transitioning into more healthier um, I see that as their only catalyst because I think they have already a global reach. So they need to do this well to secure the next 20 years. And I think there's space for them to do it because if I go to any shop now, uh, there are not so many healthy equivalents than just buying the ingredients yourself and making it yourself. So I think there's really a space for them. But I'm wor worried a little bit uh, just about their balance sheet their and their cap capability to still keep growing the dividends at the pace that they've been doing it over the last decades. And then if you combine that with their current valuation, I think, although the yield might be, what well, is it still around three and a half percent? I think we should start um, pricing it as a slow growth company. And for, for that reason, I think it's a bit on the high end of, uh, of the, of the price. Okay, nice. So that, that kind of leads in then to our next section, and that is our stock picks of the week. So, Daniel, as the guest, we welcome you to go first. Uh, well, obviously, I'm a huge fan of tea, as everyone knows. <laughs> so, uh, no, but, but all in seriousness, um, tea is 
very undervalued on uh, today's today's uh, price. So um, my pick would be T for this week. Next week, until the price looks bad again, uh, T is a great company. The debt is decreasing. Uh, that's a good uh, good sign. Payout ratio is all right. Maybe a little bit on the higher end, but it's still manageable. And the balance sheet is it's all right. So uh, in, in, in my opinion, uh, T is going to be a great company, uh, better company than it's already right now. So T is my pick. They've certainly gained a lot of traction on Twitter over the last week. Uh, yeah, I, I think my feed has been full of everybody buying tea, buying tea. So <laughs> uh, there's a lot of love out there for them at the moment. So I can the, tell you a surprise, uh, EMF. I bought tea this week. <laughs> this week. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I can tell you it was inspired by all the folks on Twitter and specifically Dividend Wave, I believe it was, who had a nice um, one slide around that with a link to their earnings. So I, I, thought, I love you know his what? slides. Yeah, exactly. So people were commenting in the past on my desired portfolio and saying like, hey, you don't have any communications in there. And I was always shying away from T. I felt like their debt, their acquisition, who buys this? What is the Time Warner? But then <laughs> um, he shared the links with me and uh, the link with me to their earnings. And what really uh, surprised me when I looked into it again is that the company has a target to keep the payout ratio below 50% while Free, still growing yeah. dividends. And this was new to me. And then I looked at what they've been doing the last two years. And they've been lowering their debt. And you referred to that as well in the past. So I started studying it again. And I still had an open position in my desired portfolio for a communications uh, company. So I decided, okay, you know what? Let's start uh, uh, looking at the cold facts and add some tea. It will really stay a small position for me. But I bought some. So I thought that was uh, a nice surprise. Uh, <laughs> That's also what it is for me, right? Uh, it's by looking at the data, at the facts, and, and not, not the emotions. Um, that, that is so nice because it allows me to change my opinion on, 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 a, on a daily basis almost by just looking at the yeah. numbers. So. I think that's a very important thing, actually, uh, not to get any feelings for any stocks. The stock market will, will seriously beat you down if, if you get any feelings for a stock. Uh, always look at the data look at the numbers and you'll be good. Uh, and as for T, it's communication services. I mean, is there one thing that the human race needs in the future? It's communication services. Uh, we're just getting better and better and we're demanding more and more when it comes to communication services and technology. Technology. So I think it's, uh, it's a great company for, for the future. I'm just a little bit jealous of you bought it. I haven't bought any, but they, they, they hold 10% of my portfolio at the minute. So I have, uh, I have enough. Enough compounding. So European DJ, what's, what's your stock pick for the week? So mine is Johnson & Johnson, actually. Um, I think this company doesn't need any introduction. No. Um, it's probably my number one tier one stock that I would always consider. And for me, this company is always interesting for me to buy uh, in this zero interest environment when it yields around 3%. So to be honest with Johnson & Johnson, I'm just purely looking at the yield, yield on cost when I purchase it. So around $135, you will get it for 3%. It's for me a nice entry point. It dips, in, it dips below it typically once in a year, once in two years. So... Uh, Johnson & Johnson, this for me, it's close. It's around 140. So if it dips under 135, I will buy it. I've got an order outstanding with this uh, limit. Um, so I just hope it will be triggered in, in, in the upcoming week or the week after. Yeah, you, you know they're one of my favorite stocks. And when in doubt, just buy Johnson & Johnson. They're a serious dividend grower. So yeah. I, I couldn't agree more with you. So EMF, um, what's yours then? So my stock pick for the week is... OMC, um, they're an advertising group, Omnicom group. I, I, I did a bit of research on them during the week and their growth has been outstanding. They have cut, well, not cut, they have suspended the dividends oh, twice, I think, over the last 20 or 30 years. 
but they've more than made up for it. They, they haven't caught it. They've kind of kept, kept it at the same level, but when they increase it, they increase it at a phenomenal rate. So for me, I think they're one of the top two companies in the world. Advertising, as you know, is, is more and more prolific, especially online. So I, I'm kind of bullish for them in the future. So they are my, they are my pick for the week. So I don't know about you, Daniel, but um, I, I actually don't really know the company. So are you going to write a blog post about it, uh, EMF? I have just wrote one and I think I published it yesterday or the day before. It's been a long week, but I, I have definitely <laughs> wrote one. <laughs> Super. So I'll, I'll, I'll have a read because I don't know it really and I'm really interested to uh, learn more I, about it. I think I know you, you like um, CEOs and leaders and I, I think they've got very good management and it'll be interesting for you to, to cool. read and I'd, lo- I'd love to hear your thoughts. Super. I mean, I mean the, uh, the fact that it, the company is in advertising, uh, I think that's very, very cool, uh, cool thing to, to be doing. Uh, and advertising is something you see more and more as well. Um, so it's, it's going to be an interesting read, uh, since I, I barely heard about the company, uh, but, um, it's an interesting sector. Uh, especially now because of all all the things around the Facebook and all the ads on, on Facebook, et cetera. So, yeah. So that, that's it for the week for me. Have you anything to add European DJ? Well, actually I'm just looking forward for the, for the upcoming week again. So I'm curious to how the stock market will, uh, will, will act based on um, the new Corona numbers that are coming out. I watched also on, um, on CNN, this report are going into a Houston hospital and the influx of patients, also youth. So I think we will see some Corona pa- panic coming up again because the only thing I can predict now in the US is that they will start closing down a lot of uh, regions again. So um, if we were with lower numbers closing down the whole country with 30% drop and now with higher numbers of new cases, not seeing a 30 person drop. I expect at least maybe a five to 10 person drop. So I hope that it happens actually, not, not for the patients, of course, but uh, more so that I can buy this Johnson & Johnson. So I'm looking forward for the next week. Yeah, I kind of agree with you. Um, obviously, I really don't want anyone to get sick or, or to die of the virus, but, but when it comes to the stock market, it's, it's a very, very attractive thing, uh, this pandemic. It kind of it kind of drops the stock market, and you get to pick all these stocks for cheaper, uh, undervalued. So it's it's kind of sad that it has to that it has to be this uh, pandemic and having people uh, in hospitals and etc. But uh, for for finding stocks, it's it's a very nice opportunity. Certainly, and and we're in earnings season as well, so that will kind of tell a lot of of how we're going to go. There's been some huge losses and, and Nike sticks out at the top of my head as, as a massive loss in earnings. So I think we're in for a lot of volatility and, and, and Nike, I'm hoping for it to dip. I hope it's not next week because I'm away camping and I'll have limited access to my, my phone maybe the week after. But I do, I do hope, I do, I do hope it does dip. But like you, I hope everyone stays safe and, and these Corona numbers go down. I mean, I mean, I mean, the, the Americans haven't really, uh, the, I mean, the virus there is so spread out. Uh, it's unbelievable uh, how, how, how bad uh, the country itself ha- has, uh, has protected itself against the virus. Um, so the dip is going to come. Uh, I'm 100% sure of it because they're not doing anything. They're just testing people. Uh, and now with, the, with President Trump uh, going publicly saying that they're testing too many people stop testing uh, obviously uh, he does not have any interest in protecting people and actually do something about it it's all it's all about the economy in his head and keeping keeping the engines going when it comes to the companies so you're going to see an impact on that uh, when more and more people either dies or lose their jobs uh, at some point, the the economy and the engines got to stop. If you don't have people to work for you, then it just doesn't doesn't work like that. 
good. So on a happy note then, EMF, I wish you a happy camping. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. So thank you all um, for having listened to us. Um, if you like this show, please give us a like on YouTube or follow us, our sub subscribers on YouTube or follow us on Spotify. Um, EMF has done a great job by making this podcast accessible via Anchor. So probably via whatever platform you prefer to listen to us, it should be there. Anything yeah, from you? Thank you to our listeners. Um, if you stuck around this far, we do, we do appreciate it. Daniel, thanks a million for coming on. It's really interesting to chat to you. Always, always great to talk to you on Twitter and, and here. So we hope to have you on again. And Thank you for having me. That's all for me.